Welcome to another edition of RCE. This is Brock Palin. You can follow me on Twitter at Brock Palin, all one word. You can also just find a link to it off of www.rce-cast.com. Also, uh, this is a special show, so I'm going to let everybody introduce themselves. We have uh, three of us, our usual, uh, myself and my co-host, and we have another guy here who we're going to talk about just regular HPC kind of things going on in the world. So guys, uh, go ahead and introduce yourselves. Hey, I'm Jeff Squires. I'm, I'm usually on with Brock here. Um, today we're going to be doing a little different. As Brock said, uh, we're going to be chatting more about HPC news and a, and a couple of outstanding HPC issues. And I think most people listening here will probably recognize our third person here at the round table. So uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, Rich? Well, thank you, Jeff. Uh, this is Rich Breckner from InsideHPC.com. And I'm really pleased to be on the show today, guys. Well, I think this is great. We're kind of having a crossover event here, um, so a little different than our normal interview style. We wanted to get, uh, you know, another person in the HPC business and just kind of chat about some things. So we got a couple of uh, recent newsworthy things to talk about, but we've also got a couple of outstanding issues that are just good to kind of, you know, at the water cooler, uh, chew on the fat about a little bit here. So, Rich, uh, give us a little, give us a little, you know, shameless plugs on the stuff that you do. All right, let's, 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 let's get that out of the way. So yeah. uh, inside HPC, it, I just had my first year uh, anniversary. I, I took over from a guy named John West who works at the DOD, and he was doing inside HPC as kind of a hobby, and uh, eventually he sold it to me because he got a big promotion. So good for you, John wow. West, good, good for me. And um, we recently expanded. Um, uh, we've been taking the information, that the whole style of Inside HPC, and we've gone on with three additional publications, Inside Big Data, Inside Cloud, and Inside Startups. So using the same format, we see these three areas as really growth um, pieces of IT. And I had all these stories coming across my desk that didn't quite fit in the HPC uh, realm of things, but I thought they were important. So now I have a place to put them. So that's what's going on with me, guys. Uh, well, you've also got like cross publishing agreements with like the register, and you've got like several authors now and stuff too. I mean, you've really expanded in the last year. Yeah, yeah. The register thing has been great because they have so much reach in uh, Europe. And what we do is we publish one of their stories once a week, and they publish one of ours. And okay. it's been a yeah, it's great. We just did a handshake, and uh, that's been going really well. And we're looking to expand that with some other pubs coming up here. So I'm excited about that. So why don't we cover some of the events that are coming up? Uh, so SC, uh, it's in is it Portland or Seattle this year? I always screw them up. Is it? it which? It's in Seattle. It's yeah. in Seattle. Okay, so I'm going to be there. Coffee. Yeah, good coffee for <laughs> yeah. everybody. Uh, so I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there the entire week. I'm coming in on Saturday, um, uh, on Sunday, actually, and I'll be leaving on Saturday. Uh, and Jeff, I know you'll be there. I don't know what days you're going to be there. I don't know what days I'm going to be there yet either, but I'll definitely be there for the whole show part of it. And okay. I'll probably be living mostly around the Cisco booth. Who knows? And I got the open MPI boff as usual as well. I think that's Wednesday at noon. I haven't looked at the, the schedule Yet I hope they do not put us opposite the uh, MPICH boff because that was kind of a bummer last year that we were both at the same time and you couldn't attend both because I wanted to go to their boff and hear what they had to say. So, yeah, yeah, and I'm going to be there all week, and we're actually going to have a booth this year up on the sixth mm. floor. So I don't know if you guys remember Seattle from uh, whatever ninety or two thousand five, but it's it's. Two floors. It's like a big Dagwood sandwich, right? So mm. um, the exhibits on two levels. Yeah. So we'll <laughs> to be honest, there. I'll probably remember it when I get there. I've been <laughs> yeah. to so many supercomputings now; they all just literally run together. So I don't yeah. know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, Seattle's going to be a great town uh, mm -hmm. for this show, and they've actually got more exhibitors this year than they had in New Orleans, but it's in less space. So think of it as kind of a <laughs> smashed together supercomputing. Sweet. We're sworn enemies are just feet from each other. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And also something that I think uh, we're all involved in one way or another is the, the student cluster competition. Yeah. Yes. Which, um, you know, yeah, Brock and I were judges for last year, and that was tremendously fun. It was really great. Yeah, yeah, they take up a lot of space. They, <laughs> if, if they're going to be crammed for space, because every one of those students effectively has a small booth. So that's, that's yeah. going to be interesting, always, always. 
Yeah, so last year, I don't know if you guys remember, but the uh, the Dark Horse, the, the little quiet team from, I think it was Taiwan, yes. won the competition, right? Yeah. And yep. uh, they, you know, the, the, the local teams were talking a lot of trash and they had to take second place. So that <laughs> I, I, I wait to see who repeats this year, who, who comes back. This is going to be good. So one thing interesting about the student cluster competition, it's, it's been at SC um, for years now. It's actually uh, expanded, and it's coming to the international supercomputing uh, show next June. And I believe yeah, it's still in Hamburg. Yeah, so they're going to do their own European version of that, probably with mostly European schools. But I was really encouraged by that, and I know a lot of uh, companies uh, worked hard to make that possible. So, um, yeah, I mean, so on that note, um, what's been going on recently is those same folks from ISC just had their ISC cloud conference this week. And what that's about is is HPC in the cloud. And I think it's the only show that really focuses on that particular aspect of cloud computing. And uh, they had Ian Foster as their uh, their keynote. And the thing I wanted to bring up is he had a very uh, interesting kind of point to his keynote and it was all about the missing middle and that cloud computing and HPC in the cloud is really enabling small business uh, startups to sprout up that wouldn't have been possible before. He sees it as a big enabler. So maybe HPC in the cloud has found its its niche at a very different end of the spectrum and I just thought that was fascinating. You know, I got to kind of agree with that. I mean, I don't have any hard market data to back this up, and I'm just some random engineer. But, I mean, you look at some of the the cluster integrators and even HP, right? HP made yeah. a killing selling, you know, 16 and 32-node clusters, right? They weren't top of the top 500, but they were the bottom 50,000 for a long time. And Microsoft has made no bones of the fact that they're going after the bottom 50,000, right? Right, so, right. You know, this is not necessarily a bad market move. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah actually, I have some experience with, with that bit, and a lot of it is a, like a one-person firm or two-person firm, I mean, really, really small is what I'm seeing, going out to like an Amazon service or a Penguin service, and they can run something really wide and get it done really quickly. Um, but where actually I had a discussion with... Um, uh, not to be named company in northern Michigan here, and we got into this discussion about software licensing issues, and I think there's a lot of space here for vendors of of ISV apps to enable getting large quantities of licenses at a reasonable cost just for the amount of time you use them for, rather than having to purchase all those licenses and sitting on them for all eternity. Um, yeah, there's been there's been, you know, periphery discussion about this and the various blogs and the news feeds and things like that. And Rich, I think you've even covered stuff about this. But I think that for this to really be an enabler, it's got to be exactly what you said, Brock. I mean, not only do I want the hardware and the electricity and the HVAC and all the other junk infrastructure that I need to, you know, run a job on 128 nodes for today. But, you know, the other part of that is the licenses. I need licensing, uh, some kind of pricing scheme that is amenable to kind of like using it like a library, right? You know, use it for a little while and give it back. Yeah, we've got the hardware down to like um, as you use, consume, resource, but we don't have the software in the same space. The software is still a, you know, a one-year commitment or a five-year commitment. It's not this as you consume space and some vendors kind of like have gone into this space yeah yeah um and, and some vendors have kind of done this but they've all done it on their own they have their own interfaces so if you want to use x application you go through their face there's no way if i need five applications right now to really do a consistent interface just like i bought all of those but then get billed for what i use so i don't know i think there's space there and i th I, th I think we're going to get there i think the market's going to demand that we move that way you know, I, I agree. You know, this is this is not a new problem. They had this back when with, with Grid, right? In the early 2000s, they were starting to, how are we going to crack this nut? And here it is 10 years later, and we're still talking about it. Yeah, I have a little hope, though, because now that there's actually hardware and dollars um, in this, and there are providers who are marketing this as a model, right? You know, so you have your... Amazons and your penguins and things like that. And with Grid, it was really just sharing between organizations, or at least that was my perception of it, right? You can get 
uh, a bunch of different definitions for what really happened back then. But, uh, you know, here I think that there's actually, you know, business is willing to fork out, you know, some amount of money so that I can run for a little while and then be done. So I think the market climate is at least a little bit different since then. And that gives me a little hope. So, guys, I guess, you know, talking about cloud at the low end, uh, some big news this week at the very, very highest end of the spectrum. Um, NetApp just announced a big win um, at the DOE, um, Lawrence Livermore. They have won a 55 petabyte um, storage win for the Sequoia supercomputer that's coming out next year. Sequoia sorry, is say 55 I, petabyte. 55 petabyte yeah so it yeah (laughs) i mean this is the i think it's the big i'm pretty sure it's the biggest single storage win ever and certainly at the doe it is um this big bad boy is for sequoia and sequoia is going to be a 20 petaflop uh, ibm blue gene q supercomputer at livermore so uh if, uh, unbelievable specs on this for IO. Um, one terabyte per second. I mean, you have to just think about wow. that. Yeah, running the Lustre file system. So huge news. And um, what makes it exciting for me is that NetApp is was not in the HPC space six months ago. They uh, they bought uh, Ingenio from LSI, uh, makers of these disk enclosures, and suddenly. Not only are they in HPC, they're at the very top of capability and storage uh, uh, bandwidth. Yeah, I think very this is what you call interesting. Fisk dot forever to you know fist that thing. <laughs> Man, that is <laughs> that is this is ridiculous having to deal with that. I, I'd be curious to actually speak with one of the guys implementing that and the way Luster works. And we had one of the Luster guys on RCE before and. Are you curious how they're actually laying that thing out? Yeah, um, you know the WAM Cloud guys will be supporting that, so um, okay. you know I, I'm, I bet you they'd love to talk to you about uh, what their plans are for supporting that bad boy. Well, that fits right in that uh, big data category. I mean, one terabyte a second. I mean, if they spec it, they must have a use for it. Um, sustained one terabyte a second. I mean, that's just a boatload of data. Where's it coming from? Probably the places we can't even talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess the, the machine will be used for a wide variety of research. You know, they gave it the standard spiel, you know, of bioinformatics and, you know, a- academia. But uh, you, you, right. you got to wonder, wonder what else is going to be going on there. So, huge yeah, machine. Uh, What's normally the benchmark for those really large systems? You need to dump the contents of RAM to disk in a certain amount of time. Normally, that's what the the uh, benchmark is for checkpointing those massive systems. So if you're looking at a 20 petaflop, I don't know if that's peak or sustained. This is the first I've heard about Sequoia. So yeah, that, that's you, peak. Okay, yeah, peak. But still, that's a really big box. You need a yeah. lot of bandwidth if you want to checkpoint anything reasonably to get value out of that box. So. It's just yeah, keeping the whole system balanced. Yeah, yeah Blue Jean's a little different architecture, though. Um, it's not quite the same thing as uh, even a well integrated rack of boxing, right? Yeah. So, you know, checkpointing is not as big of a deal. I, don't get me wrong, I don't know a whole lot about Blue Jean, so probably somebody will tell me I'm wrong. But um, my meager understanding was that it's not. Like you have to checkpoint it not infrequently like you do on a, a typical cluster kind of thing because the, the MTBF is, is a little better simply because it's quote unquote one machine. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. But still, yeah, but you're, you still know, a know. really big one machine with a lot of oh. components. <laughs> yeah. I mean, True. Uh, Fair enough, Je- yeah. so Jeff, you're an MPI guy, so you got to write, um, you know, an MPI for 1.6 million CPUs. So, yeah. Oh, have at that. Believe it or not, we actually <laughs> talk about that. There's there's a lot of issues involved there, and um, you know, both us and MPitch are are moving in those directions. I think um, let's see, OpenMPI is run at fifty, sixty thousand cores, fifty, sixty thousand processes, something like that. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, still, that's a far cry from a million. Right, and there's mm-hmm. still a lot of issues to uh, surround there. There's a lot of network and hardware issues too, right? Because MPI, in some way, is just the thing that exposes how good or bad your hardware and the abstractions that you present upward are. Right? You know, like, do you really want a connected type network? 
I don't know. So <laughs> I, I could go off on an MPI spiel for a long time. So let's well, let's not go there. <laughs> well, I guess I guess, I think that the, the core issue here is that uh, at least even on a machine like Jaguar today, which is what uh, two petaflops, there's only like five codes that really run at that scale, and they're yeah. all high energy. It, they're all high energy physics, right? So it isn't like you were going to write something new from scratch to go run on Sequoia that uses the whole machine. That that probably isn't going to happen. Yeah, I mean, even at our local resource here, our largest single fabrics, 2,000 cores, largest single thing ran on it besides the first Linpack, um, 480 cores so far. So, you know, it's really how you slicing it up and what's it being used for. Yep. And what hardware are you targeting? Are you going to be targeting accelerators or just CPUs and trusting ah. your, you know, magic software tools to fork it out onto like an Intel MIC or something like that, right? I mean, the model is changing again, <laughs> right? And so what is the software going to do, right? So what are these existing applications going to do to take care of? I mean, accelerators to me is a fascinating topic. They're really starting to finally come into their own. And for certain types of applications, they are super great, right? And and <laughs> you can quote me on that, super great. There, how's that for a phrase? Um, but uh, you got to adapt the software to do it. There are a few magic tools, and those magic tools work very well, but they don't, you know, fit everything. And so it's it's a challenge, right? Yeah. Well, we had some some news on that this week, right? With accelerators, um, Intel's Mic architecture had a huge win. What was that last week? But uh, the TAC Stampede system that's coming out next year. Uh, this will be a ten petaflop system. It will be accelerated by Mic. And uh, their whole spiel, as you know, Jeff, is that this thing's much easier to program than an yeah. accelerated system with GPUs. I, in my gut, feel that that is probably true, but I want to see it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I'm a vendor too, but uh, you know, I think we all have a, a healthy degree of skepticism about vendor claims when it meets the, you know, the crusty Fortran codes that have got to run on this stuff. So, right. um, I, I hope they're right because that is a major problem with uh, the accelerators is you know changing the codes and changing your kernels and uh, things like that. And but. You know, I, I don't want to downplay some of the prior guests we've had on here on RCE, you know, writing tools that provide computational kernels that magically run on GPUs or CPUs, and they just do the right thing in the background, kind of like MPI does for networks. And, and those things work really well if that's what your, you know, those kernels are what your application is using and things like that. But the inherent programmability for all the random stuff and all the stuff that the missing middle wants to do, right? They don't want to write custom GPU code. They want to just write some code that uh, works. And so Certainly. is it going to work well on an MIC? I don't know. I, I hope so. Yeah, I mean, I can yeah. throw out something to one of our, our second guests ever on the show, Josh Anderson into Whom Decode. You know, they're here at U of M where I'm at, and I support their users, and they just did a huge buy of large number of GPUs for their code. Their performance improvements over traditional CPU MD codes is still absolutely amazing, even as they add more restrictions and make the code more complicated. And they've really become masters of doing these things in these massively threaded, simple core kind of ways that these types of tools have been requiring. And it's 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 really, really neat what they're doing in, in the power envelope, the footprint, the cost, everything has just been absolutely amazing. And I sit on their mailing list, and the traffic on their mailing list just keeps growing. I think this stuff's going to stick around. It's not going to be like some of the other tools we've seen in the past where they kind of, they look neat, but they go away. And I think these things are going to stick around this time. Well, it, it, you know, it, it, again, coming back to supercomputing, you know, Jensen Wang, uh, the CEO of uh, NVIDIA, is the keynote this year. And there was some controversy about this, but uh, you look at what's happened with accelerators in the past year. Um, China and Japan are at the top of the top 500. It, it's, it's a force that you can't just ignore. And uh, just what I was at the G GPU conference last year, it was like 3,000 scientists there, and they're using this stuff for their daily business. So 
uh, there was a hundred startups there that are basing business models on GPUs and accelerated science. So there's really a lot going on, and uh, uh, you know it it may not be the answer for all codes, but it's certainly got a, a role to play. It's it's just so accessible. I mean, your laptop comes with a GPU compared to old things like this is now something that you can just go and try and the cost entry point is lower and there's all these things I think was a perfect storm to make this work out to people to actually develop on well let me be the naysayer um, just just to play devil's advocate here don't forget your laptop comes with two or four cores too right yeah and yes. uh, you know that's a far cry from MIC but you know maybe someday grandma will have an MIC in her laptop just so she can watch YouTube I mean who knows right <laughs> <laughs> um, but for me, the, the kicker is the memory bandwidth, right? Because when you that, – that's still a huge problem for all GPU codes today is to get the, the data down you know, from main memory down onto the device and then back. And that's, I, right. I say that's a huge problem mainly from my own foxhole because of the whole MPI perspective. You know, we can't communicate directly with the G, – we can't network send and receive directly from device memory. Right, and the same problem is going to be with the MIC unless that stuff gets memory on board somehow. Or I don't, I don't know exactly how that's going to go, but you know, tying it into the network because no matter how many you stuff in one box, you still got to talk to your friends across a network. And so, how that network and integration happens, and the memory bandwidth integration happens, these are still unknowns, I think. Or at least well, not publicly yeah. known. <laughs> well, Jeff, you know, where we see yeah. that a lot is a lot of people I've worked with have wanted to do parallel across GPUs, not even across hosts, but inside the same host. And you mm -hmm. really can't do that right now to get desirable performance, good time to solution. It's like just run two cases independently, stick them under each GPU and just leave them there. Don't try to use multiple GPUs on one problem right now. It's just that whole communicating back and forth inside the box, let alone going from device to other host to device is just not an option right now really so I have to agree with you totally on that yeah I'd, I'd love to see where the hardware vendors are going to go with this because at this point it's there are software workaround solutions but you kind of lose a bunch of performance in doing so and so I think there's going to need to be some kind of you know hardware changes over time to make these things better and I, I'm, I'm it's going to be real interesting to watch where where this stuff goes yeah i just i don't see how they can continue to just go across the pci bus um and and get the kind of scaling that they want so we'll have to watch that yeah i actually have my own prediction for the gpu type stuff and we already see amd doing what my prediction is and i won't go into it here but i expect intel to do similar things with mike and other things in the future it's just I think it's inevitable. Oh, no, you can't drop a bomb like that and not give the prediction. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So all it is is I see when we have eight core CPUs rather than each core having its own vector unit, its own SSE four, is that we're going to have a bunch of scalar cores and regular floating point units, and then we're going to have a mic type thing sitting right on a die next to it, and the individual cores will schedule their time when they can take advantage of it when they can rather than duplicating that silicon in four you know four eight you know twelve places in the future so. so you're talking you know normal dedicated cpus plus the specialized mic stuff next to it for on demand so to speak yeah but i would actually expect that that would trap like sse instructions and other vector instructions and remove the individual vector units from every core and push it all on to something like mic because i think you get silicon back for that Interesting. I'm not enough of a, a smoke packer to know whether that's true or not, but that's uh, that's an interesting theory. Yeah. No, I'm not a I'm not a computer engineering like hardware enough guy to really know if that's feasible or not. But I would not be surprised. And like I said, we already see it with AMD. They've got their Fusion or whatever. They got a CPU and GPU core all on one hunk of chip. So this is true. And um, let's not forget the whole Denver project out of uh, NVIDIA, right, where they, they got yeah. ARM licenses. And the supposition yeah. that I think is pretty obvious is that they're doing something there to put things on chip. So I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, we're going back to Vector. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, all I mean, that's, Vector yeah. mainframes. <laughs> well, a lot of people would love that. The big SMP again, a monumental, huge 20 petaflop SMP would just be very welcome, I think. 
Yeah. No one could afford it, but they yeah. love it. Well, no, it would be the next model of TiVo, right? You need that to record all the TV you want to watch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, well spe- speaking of big, big monsters, uh, did you guys want to talk about Blue Waters and where that's at here? Oh, yeah, let's let's talk about some Blue Waters. It, it well, it, it's it's of course it's as as of recording here today, it's still up in the air. I mean, IBM canceled the contract uh, about a month ago. Um, they weren't able to uh, uh, deliver. The story came out this week, thanks to the Freedom of Information Act, that IBM tried to delay uh, Blue Waters by a year, and as far back as December of uh, 2010. And the NCSA guys were not going for that, and that eventually led to the the thing collapsing. So the big crisis now is: can they replace uh, IBM as the vendor for Blue Waters before the money goes away? So I want to do a quick Vegas odds, uh, Brock and Jeff. Which is it going to be? Is the money going to go away, or are they going to pull it out and pick a um, a Cray, an SGI, or even an IBM maybe as a vendor? What do you think, Jeff? All right, so I'm going to take this, and I, I have no vendor knowledge involved here, so I, I, I am not giving away anything at all because I am not part of this situation at all. But I would find it remarkably difficult to be able to do what they want to do in the time that's left uh, with any vendor, right? Because IBM had done so much work and to push the envelope and to be able to achieve the scales that they wanted to, to achieve in Blue Waters. And they were, you know, getting down that road. And finally, they said, no, we're just not going to make it. And now you've got not enough. What was it? Three-year contract? And they were two years into it? Is that right? Yeah. 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 And, and so there's less than a year left for somebody new to come on the scene. And uh, you can't take anything that IBM's done. you got to do something new. And it's not like you can just you know, throw a bunch of Sandy Bridge servers together and, and call it Blue Waters, right? It's going to take a lot more integration than that. So I, I think the money's going to go away. That's just my personal opinion. Okay. Brock, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I got to go with Jeff there. there. There's not enough time. I mean, there could be an extension. Also, I, you know, oh, man, the the Cray guys are going to hate me, but I think IBM so far in the recent past has been the only company to show that kind of innovation in the U.S. Uh, Fujitsu could probably do it, but given you know political perceptions of funding and everything else, I don't think that's going to happen. They're not going to be brought in as a vendor, I don't think. So I say probably only 20% odds that this whole thing is going to fly and we will have a sustained one petaflop machine. Because like that that Sequoia machine, you said that's that's twenty petaflop peak, but that's not one yeah. petaflop sustained. So, this is solving right. a different kind of problem. So I'm, I'm going to be... you know what? Uh, hold on, I want to amend mine a little bit because I forgot about this is embarrassing, but I forgot about Cray yeah. and they did just a new, uh, introduce some new model that I know nothing about. Um, is that guy the XE six or something? Something? Yes. Yeah. That's that's their that's their GPU accelerated uh, machine. So, okay. so, so it uses AMD I, processor. That and, that, yeah. I don't know. Maybe that's a contender, but I know nothing about it. So before somebody shoots me down, <laughs> that's what I want to say. I'm sorry, Rich. Go ahead. All right. All right. So, so we, got, we got two votes. The money goes away. I'm going to go out on a limb and say IBM comes back in with Blue Jean Q and gets a revised contract that they can live with and really? wins this thing before the money goes away. I have no inside knowledge to that effect, but huh. I think that's what's going to happen. So we'll have to see what happens. All right, give, give us some rationale on that. Why do you think that's going Why do you think that's going Well, go? I mean, I think, I think Brock touched on it. I mean, IBM has shown, um, you know, they've, they've put out a, a boatload of patents on Blue Gene Q. It's a totally different architecture than what they bid for Blue Waters, right? That was Power 7. Um, from what I understand, they had trouble building that thing at scale with the interconnect for... Um, in the time frame they had would just cost them too much money. It was a business decision. IBM wants to make money. They pulled out, even though it embarrassed the hell out of them, I'm sure. Um, this could save them face. Blue Jean Q is a totally different approach. Um, can they do a, a petaflop uh, s- sustain? 
I think they can convince those guys that are looking at a big empty computer room that they can. So that's my bet. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I'd be curious if you can actually get there with a wide enough variety of codes that one petaflop mark using the traditional Q, a blue gene style architecture. Because blue gene was exactly what I was thinking about, about IBM demonstrating, you know, recently having something new and fully integrated that was truly a changer of the way you can do a high performance system. So, yeah. Uh, I, okay, I, I'll revise mine up to 30%. How about that? I'll, I'll give you that. <laughs> <laughs> You got me. I'm, you got still me gonna, convinced. I'm still going to stay with uh, thumbs down on it. I'd love to be proved wrong because it's a it's a crummy situation for yeah. everybody involved, right? So you know, I know some of the guys over there at NCSA and whatnot, and everybody's bummed, and so it just kind of sucks. So I'd love to be proved wrong, but uh, maybe I'm just a pessimist. <laughs> yeah, I mean, those guys they'd love to tell their story from their end and get on the record, but they just can't. So uh, yeah. let's hope for the best for those folks. Well, guys, it's really been fun talking, and I'd like to uh, announce that uh, we've already decided to plan to do this again uh, live from the supercomputing uh, show floor. Uh, Inside HPC will have a booth up on the sixth floor, and uh, Brock and Jeff have agreed to come up there and do a show summary on Thursday. We'll maybe even try to do it live. So uh, I'm looking forward to that and seeing you guys at SC11 in Seattle. Yeah, with the red hat. With the red hat. Do I get <laughs> to tell that story before we pitch. go? <laughs> yes, all right. Tell, us, tell us where the red hat comes from. Okay, so I've been wearing this red hat for years, but uh, it started at Supercomputing, actually. And uh, we at, I was working at Sun doing the booths there for years. And in 2003, we built a rocks cluster in our booth uh, with the SDSC guys. And it was a 128-node cluster. It started from bare metal with nodes on the table, and by 9 o'clock on Monday night, we had that big bad boy up up and running code. So uh, we all got red hats for that, and I've worn it ever since. And um, part of it was it really pissed off my bosses at Sun to be wearing a red hat um, yeah. <laughs> in the exhibit. <laughs> Which is an excellent reason to keep wearing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so, we all know where that went, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> well, cool. Well, yeah, so we're all going to be at Supercomputing. We're going to do this live show or, or some flavor of show on Thursday, which I think will be tremendously fun. So yeah. uh, stop by. Come find us all. Uh, we'll all be in our various places in and around Supercomputing. We'd love to say hello. Okay, guys, thanks a lot. Yeah, we'll all be at SC, and we'll have the show soon, and we'll give it to Rich to post on Inside HPC so he can distribute it how he wants, and we'll um, see all you guys around. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks.